So my name is Bert Beckwith, and this is going to be a talk on GORM. And this is actually a uh, very old talk. So in 2009, long, long time ago, I went to uh, my very first conference as a speaker um, at Spring One in um, in New Orleans, and uh, it was pretty amazing. <coughs> I'll tell you a, a super quick little story. So um, it was my first conference. I had spoken at a local user group, um, but I had never been at a, at a conference before. And I saw a tweet from Guillaume Laforge saying that um, we have a couple slots available um, for the community. You know, so all the Spring Source employees and all the Grails and Groovy guys had submitted their talks, and they had a few slots available. So that he said, you know, here's a form you can fill out to submit some talks. And I thought, well, that'd be good. You know, I'd, I, I had been trying to get my my employer to uh, my previous employer to send me to Spring One because we had used a lot of Spring and Hibernate and, and um, Spring Two Five at the time was the hot thing so I really wanted them to send me there so so I I, I sent in two talk uh, suggestions and I just rambled on I said you know I'm I've d I've done a lot of work into the security I've done the CG and Spring security and I can do blah 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 and I've done a lot on Gorm and I can do blah 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 so it was very unstructured and sort of sort of almost um, like I was speaking. And they replied and said, you know, that looks good, but could you reformat that in the, um, in the, in the, in our more standard format? So I looked up on the website of the previous years and I looked how people tended to write those things. And while I was rewriting my two proposals, I came up with three more ideas. So I was thinking sort of like a shotgun approach, you know, um, just give them as many as I can. And all I needed was one talk accepted. And then they were going to fly me there for free and put me up in a hotel and I can go to, and I can see all these amazing people. You know, if I'm lucky, maybe I can meet Graham and, and I'll see all these you know, spring rock stars. That was in the good old days before all the amazing spring folks left because um, they got rich after the acquisition and they were all millionaires. So um, so like a few days later, I get a, an email back and, and he says, uh, really sorry, Bert. Um, we, uh, unfortunately, we can only accept four of your five talks. <laughs> so of course, I was elated. I was like, oh my God, this is so awesome. Four talks and I'm going to go to New Orleans and I'm going to do all this stuff. And then a couple minutes later, I was like, oh my God. I have six hours of material to come up with because they have 90 minute talks. So I was like, how am I going to do <laughs> six hours of stuff? So I get down there, everything, it was, a, it was an amazing uh, conference. So I did this, I did, I had a, a GORM talk and, and it was basically three parts. So it was the topic that I'm going to talk about here and then a couple other ones. And then this one ended up being a lot bigger than I expected and it took up almost the entire time. Um, and it was really fun because, um, you know, this morning my keynote was, I, I, at least I tried to be funny. I hope you, you uh, folks uh, thought it was funny. Uh, this is not a f funny talk at all. This is a very serious and hopefully very scary talk. And it was really interesting because there were a lot of people that I knew, like in the front row. Dave Klein was right there and Ken Cousin was right there. So all these, all these people. And they're all like, oh my God, the whole time they were just like freaking out because I could sort of see that they were like, oh my God, I have to go home right now and fix all my code because... <laughs> So, um, in the years since then, I've referenced that talk a lot, and I've, when when these ideas come up, um, I've given people links to the video. It, the video's online, and the the slides are online. And I said, yeah, you take a look at it. It's a it's a relatively short talk, and hopefully, it's it'll it'll help you. And uh, what I've always said is, unfortunately, even though many years have passed, the the ideas that I was talking about back then in uh, 2009 are exactly as valid today as they were then. That's still true right now. So I was thinking that uh, rather than pointing people at that old talk, it'd be good to sort of redo the talk and uh, do it inside of a Grails 3 context. And I also was kind of curious, you know, if it was still, you know, what had changed and if it was still a problem. Um, so there's a few things that are a little bit better, but it's, it's still bad. So, so the talk was not called Has Many Considered Harmful, but uh, now it is. Um, so I used to work used to work for Pivotal and I don't anymore. I'm starting to think that's not actually their real logo. <laughs> I don't know where I found that. <laughs> I found it in Photoshop is where I found it. Um, oh, GIMP, I don't use Photoshop. But uh, So here's a link to the original talk, the old, the old slides. Um, and then there was a guy, Paul Woods, and he hasn't really been around very much uh, that I've seen, but he was kind of active on the mailing list uh, years ago. And he did a blog post a, a year and a half later or so after I had done that talk, because he had applied those techniques on his application. And so it was really nice because um, it's always nice to have a second perspective and validation that he saw the same things that I saw. So that's, it's still, it's, it's kind of dated, but I, you know, I, th I think there's some, still some really good information there. So I recommend that you, you check that out. Um, and I also did this talk in India 
uh, at GreatConf in January. Um, the the talk isn't online yet, and I'm pretty much going to do the same talk now. So there's nothing to link to, but you know, it's basically going to be the same talk. And I'm going to be uploading. There's a there's a link in the slides um, for the GitHub repo where I'm going to be uploading some sample code. So I don't think I'll have enough time to do the demos, but I, yeah, I, I think the demos aren't necessary because hopefully you'll understand what I'm. You know, I don't need to show you what's happening. You'll understand. And I want to make a point really, really clear. If um, please interrupt if you have any questions. We, we'll have hopefully time at the end for questions. But if anything doesn't make sense, um, I quite often speak too quickly. <laughs> Native English speakers often have a hard time understanding what I'm saying. Spanish speakers even more so. So if you don't understand something I'm saying, um, if you have a question, please uh, be be rude and, and interrupt. So what is the problem we're talking about here? So. Um, uh, it's all about mapping collections and the performance problems that are uh, that are um, pretty much guaranteed to happen when you use mapped collections, and we do this all the time. Has many, uh, one to many, and many to many. We do this all the time, right? This is really standard stuff. And you you might tweak that by saying you know set visits to change it into a set uh, a list visits, right? Because by default it's a set. Um, but this should look very familiar. You guys probably show hands. You guys all use this, right? Of course. Why wouldn't you? It's what the documentation says to do, and no one else told you except me. No one ever told you not to. So, okay. So, library has many visits. So the idea here, and this is even more valid than it ever was, is you've got an incredibly oppressive um, fascist government, um, say like America today, and um, they now want to make sure that you don't have any information that could be da make you dangerous. So whenever you go to the library, you can't just walk into the library and look at books. Obviously you need a library card to take out books, but they don't even want you going in there without being tracked. So you have to track your visits every time you go. And they keep this all in a big database, and at some point they're going to try to use it to kick you out of the country, even if you're a citizen. Uh, or just shoot you. So, so we have a domain class that represents libraries. And in a real application it would have an address and all. It would be a lot more complicated, but for, for simplicity's sake we'll say it has a name and then we, a library has many visits. So every library has uh, a bunch of visits. This library has different visits. So it's one to many. Doesn't make sense for this to be many to many. Um, so then for the, on the visit side, uh, we want to record the person that visited. So in a real app, that would be, of course, you'd have a person class or a user class. Here, we're just storing the name, keep, keep things simple, record the date. And then to hook it back again, we, uh, we make it a bidirectional relationship. And we say that the visit belongs to a library. So that does a handful of things. So um, it, by saying it belongs to, we set up a cascading relationship. So if we delete a library, Grails and Gorm will cascade the deletes for us. So it'll delete all the visits first, and then it'll delete the library. That's great, right? That's convenient. So you don't have to do that yourself. It also not only establishes the ownership relationship, but it also creates a field of type library that's the thing to the right of the colon. And the thing to the left, by convention, is just lowercase of the class name. But that could be L, it could be lib, it could be foo. You know, the word library on the left isn't important, but that's the variable name of the library and that gets added to the class. So there's an AST transform that's applied during compilation that actually creates, this isn't metaprogramming, you know, this isn't dynamic. There's actually a field called library in the visit class. And likewise, on the library side, there's a collection of visits um, on the library. So it's a set by default. It can, you can make it a list. And it's not going to be a regular set. It's not going to be a hash set or a you know, link hash set or anything like that. It's going to be a hibernate smart um, uh, change, um, um, change aware um, set. So it implements a set interface, but it's actually a, it's, it's called a persistent set. And it's a hibernate class. Um, so it has the same you know, interface as set, so it guarantees uniqueness. If we s change it to a list, it'll be a persistent list. So it implements the list interface, all those methods that we expect. And the contract is that with a set, everything's unique, but not necessarily ordered. And with a list, it's ordered, uh, but not necessarily unique. Right? So that's standard collection type stuff. So far, this seems like a very normal thing to do. <coughs> so how do we use this? We create a library at some point. So the dot, dot, dots are really sort of, can be many days, many minutes, or, or almost no time in between. But at some point early in the process, we store all the libraries in the database. 
And then we start adding visits, right? So how do we add a visit to a library? We use add to visits. That's a dynamic method. In earlier versions of Grails, that used to be a, uh, a dynamic method. It would, it would be, there'd be a method missing, except, uh, thrown, and then Grails would wire that up. Now it's actually um, wired into the, into the bytecode, so it's actually there as a method. Um, and then there's a remove from visits also, so that you can remove a visit, uh, unattach a visit to a library. <laughs> all standard stuff. So you create a new visit, set all the data that it needs, add it to the library. You don't save the visit. You save the library. The library becomes dirty because its collection changed. And then it saves the visit for you. Everything cascades, everything's nice, everything's great. And then a little while later, we add a different visit for a different person. We save that. Pretty cool, right? It's very object-oriented. It's very convenient. Um, it's very groovy with lowercase g. Um, so what's, what's the table structure here? So this is um, it's either MySQL or H2. It doesn't much matter. But we have a primary key, standard auto increment primary key, and a, and a version. By default, all Grails domain classes have an ID and a version. Uh, you can disable versioning if you want. <coughs> and then we have the, the persistent properties in the class. So in the case of the library, there's only the one name. <coughs> and then in the visit, we again also have a ID and version. And then we set up the primary key. And then there's a visit date and the person name. But, it's, it, but to reference the library, remember we have the, it's, it's bidirectional. So we have a, a link back to the library from the visit. And that's not required. It just makes sense to have it be able to go both ways. And that's done with a foreign key. So the name of the column is going to be the variable name underscore ID. Standard stuff, right? Um, and the important thing here is that library ID. That's a foreign key, standard database stuff. So relational databases don't have the concept of collections. That doesn't make sense, right? This is just a concept that we use in our heads to sort of, well, you know, in, in Hibernate, they talk about the impedance mismatch, right? You're trying to store objects and object relationships in a relational database. That is an unnatural thing to do. And the way that we end up uh, doing that can sometimes be kind of strange. Um, so what we do is we infer that many visits have the same library ID, the same reference back to the same library. So we say that the library has many visits. So that's a standard database terminology to use. And that, so that was the reason why the keyword for GORM to trigger all this stuff is has many, because that it's, it's the way we talk about it anyway. And then at the bottom, we have a foreign key, and maybe you might have a, an index on the uh, foreign key for performance, whatever. So again, so there's nothing new here at this point. <coughs> so why is this bad? The collection of visits is a set, and it's an org hibernate collection persistent set. And the way, if you have 50 visits that you know are unique, by your, your application guarantees that they're unique. Because you've declared that it's a, it's a set, Hibernate doesn't know when you're trying to add the new one if it's unique. And the, way that it can, the only way it can know that is either to do a query or to load all the instances. And for, because you probably will need the instances in addition to doing the uniqueness check, it'll actually load in all of the previously stored instances. And then it'll insert the new visit into the set and just, it's just like a regular, a regular set. Um, if it's already there, then it'll be a no-op. It won't be added. Nothing's dirty. Nothing changes. Um, but in our case, we know that they're all unique. So we, we, we want to add a 51st visit. So we load in the old 50. We add in a 51st item to the collection. And we save the library. That cascades again. And now that, that uh, collection has been initialized. And it's, it has dirty checking enabled. So it's going to know what changed. One thing changed. There's a new thing in it. So the other 50, don't need to, you don't need to do anything with those 50 instances. They're all good. Um, but now we, have to, we detect that there's a new one, and we save it. Well, if you were doing this without Hibernate, if you had the unfortunate uh, situation of, of, of having to write all your SQL by hand, that's not how you do it. You just insert a record into the, into, into the visits table, right? Why are we loading visits when all we want to do is add one new one? But that's how, GORM, that's how GORM works, and that's how Hibernate works. So we load 50 instances, and we throw them away. 
Doesn't sound so bad. It's only 50 instances. You know, there's, they only have one, maybe two or three or four properties. That's not, not a big deal. What about in a year from now, when we've got 10 million visits at that library, and we want to add in the 10 million, 10 million in first visit? It's literally going to load 10 million visits from the database, populate that collection, add in one extra one, detect that it's dirty by one, and then do the change that's needed to make that change persistent in the database. It's going to insert a row into the visits table. We just loaded 10 effing million visits for no reason. Show of hands, who thinks that's great? That's awesome. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> um, and I'm not exaggerating. This is exactly how it works. So the good news is that most of us are optimists, and many of us would like to be rich. And a lot of times when we go to a new company or we start a new project or something, we are fully confident that this is going to be the next Facebook, the next Snapchat, the next Twitter, or even better, the next Twitter killer. We're all going to have, it's going to be massively scaled, and we're going to have all these performance things and all these cool challenges to solve, and we're going to be on the news, and we're going to be rich and famous and we're going to, you know, be, it's, life is going to be good. So we expect that everything's going to be huge. The, the good thing is, <laughs> rarely happens, and in reality, our collections don't tend to be all that big. Um, but, how do you know? The, and the problem with that mindset is, even if you plan on it being a fairly small application, let's say, for example, that it's not, a, it's not a, an application on the internet. It's an internal company uh, tool that you wrote for other maybe business users or maybe even other developers, or something like that. So you know, it's, it, you know the, the traffic's not going to be very heavy and it's not going to be that, that um, heavily used. So you don't really, you're not really paranoid about performance. You know, it's good enough. It, it performance is pretty good. But then you never know if a year from now someone's going to see this thing and say, hey, you know what? We should, if we just added you know, this feature and this feature and this feature, we could put it on the internet and make tons of money. And now this application that you never worried about performance in is going to be, now instead of you being famous, for being awesome. You're going to be famous for being the guy, the guy that wrote a really crappy application. So you just never know if, if, if the performance problems are going to be significant or not. So jumping ahead a little bit, it turns out that the fix for these problems that I'm going to be talking about, it, are, the fixes are fairly straightforward, fairly easy. It's a little bit more work. It's not quite as golden path as, as you would um, expect them to be from the documentation. But it's not that much more work to do it right and to future-proof the application's performance so that it's going, to be, it's going to be right today and 10 years from now. So if we, wh but what if it was a list? So I talked about uniqueness and a set. So we have to load all 50 instances, we have to load all 10,000 instances to guarantee that that new instance is unique. But if we, if we say it's a list, then GORM is going to add in an index column and it's going to remember the order within the list in memory and then it's going to store, when it stores that list to the database, it's going to retain that order. So if, you, if, you've, if you've mapped it as a list and you add in a 51st visit, you still have to load all 50 instances because Hibernate doesn't know that the instance is going at the end. It might be in the middle, it might be at the beginning. It doesn't know that it's going to have to shuffle things around and insert it in the middle. So it's going to load all the instances and then it's going to insert it wherever you told it to insert it, which may be at the end, might be in the middle, who cares. And then it's going to do the dirty checking see that there's a new element, and it's going to say... So it's really the same problem, whether it's a list or a set. The contract is different, you know, set versus list, but the Hibernate performance aspects, the GORM performance aspects, are exactly the same. So when I last gave this talk, I had, been, I had read about bags. Hibernate has this concept of bags, and we, we don't talk about this much in Grails, um, but if you read the... Um, what's the big green book, the Hibernate book, uh, Hibernate Persistence with Java, right? The, the, the Bible of Hibernate. And uh, if you read the, that book, you know, they talk about bags. Because there are definitely good use cases for bags. Now, a bag is just a generic collection. It doesn't have, it's not a set, it's not a list, it's just a collection of stuff. So there's no guarantees of anything. I was hoping at the time, when I gave this talk, that the solution would be to figure out how to work with bags inside of Grails. Because Gorm doesn't have any support for bags. But we can make it work, right? So, um, I was hoping that it wouldn't necessarily totally fix the problem, but it would make it a lot better. It turns out <laughs> that uh, you can map it by just saying collection visits. 
So this isn't in the documentation um, because it's rarely done. But it turns out, and you can read this blog post for all the gory details um, with SQL examples and, and, and problems, that it's actually always at least as bad, and in some cases worse, than using a list or a set. Because it actually, there, is an, there are a couple of optimiz optimizations that a set and a list give you that without those, with, when it's only a bag, it gets even worse. So <laughs> I was so depressed when I, when I figured that out. I was like, oh, man. And um, so then I was back to the fixes that I'm going to be talking about here. So, but you may say, but it's lazily loaded, right? And that's, I think, the crutch that we use. So we say, when you, so, so step back a bit from, from adding instances, right? So um, you load in a library. You say library.get5 or library find by whatever, whatever, and you get an instance back. And remember, well, let's look back at the definition of the library class. So all it's got is a single property, name, right? When you load in a, a persistent library instance from the database, it's going to populate the name, but it's going to have an uninitialized visits collection. It's, uh, it's, it's, gonna be, um, it's not going to be null. The only time that collection is ever null is when you, bring up, when you create a new instance in memory. But when you load it from the database, th there's, there's really no concept of a null um, collection in Hibernate. A collection is either empty, and ha which has no elements, or it has elements. And there are certainly plenty of, of times, um, logically, you know, business rules-wise, when null is the same thing as empty. But it's not always the same. Null and empty are, are quite often uh, different. And in, in the case of these collections, it, it's very different because for persistent instances, you, should, you will never have a, a null collection. It'll always either be empty or not empty. So when this um, collection comes, uh, when this instance is, is loaded in memory, it'll have a non-null collection, um, but it'll be uninitialized. So it's sort of, sort of halfway between null and, and empty. Sorry, I have a cold, and that's I'm going to blow up the speakers when I when I do this. Um, so the first time you touch the visits um, object in a way that requires it to go to the uh, data database to get um, data, so that includes you know looping through it or getting any instances or even getting the size. Anything that requires uh, real data is going to it's, so that's lazy loading, right? So by, if you never touch that, that, if you never query that object, then it'll only have the name and there's no performance cost at all. But as soon as you do one thing with a visit, you add a new instance to it, you remove one from it, you get the size, you, you get an iterator for it or anything, then it's going to go to the database, fully populate the, the uh, collection, and then you'll be ready to go. So that does help. That's a good thing. Lazy loading is great because you don't want to eagerly load all those objects every single time. Sometimes you do, but most of the time you don't. So that gives us a sort of a false sense of security because we think it's lazily loaded. So yeah, there's potential performance problems, but you know, it's not a big deal because it doesn't always load them from the database. But it loads them from the database when, when it's expensive to do it, and that's, that's why it's a problem. So you also get artificial optimistic locking exceptions. Very, very frustrating uh, optimistic locking, locking exceptions. Because um, when you modify any property of a persistent instance, the instance is, is, is considered dirty, right? Because Hibernate has dirty checking for every persistent property. And the visits collection is a property of the library class. It's a weird property because it's a collection. So it's not a single valued uh, property. It's a property that is a collection. But it is still a, a property of the class. So if the collection changes, then the library itself is dirtied and will bump the version of the library. Even if nothing real in the library class has changed, if you don't change the name or any of the quote unquote real data, if you add a new instance to the library's visits collection, that will bump the version of the library. So that's annoying because consider this. You and you both go to the library at nearly the same time go to the same library, two different people, two different names. And in the application, in two different sessions, um, we load in the, the, the collections, and then um, you save yours, and then you save yours. And we change, the, so let's say the initial version of the library instance is five. 
So when you dirty it and change it, it's going to bump to 6. And when you change it and bump it, you're, it's going to go to 7. But if you do those close enough together, you're going to get an optimistic locking exception. Now, you should only get an optimistic locking exception on the library class if you try to change the name at the same time, or some other real property. But it doesn't make any sense if you're just adding instances to, the, to a collection to throw an exception on saying that the library's been, monitor, been uh, modified, but it does. So, and actually, one of the things that really motivated this, this talk and, and the research that, that led me to, um, to understanding the problem enough that I could do the original talk was I had a contract and I was doing some consulting and uh, it was mostly spring security, uh, some other stuff, but a lot of spring security. And the, the company had done a, had a, had a, they added a new feature. And the way that it was implement, implemented was they, added, they emailed everyone in the company and said, hey everyone, we have this cool new feature. So click here to try it out. And what would happen is they had a uh, single sign-on with um, LDAP and you know, um, Active Directory. So you, you are always logged in. So, um, and it would, in order to access this new feature, you'd have to be gr granted a role that would allow you to access that. But they would just automatically grant you the role the first time you used it. So what was happening, and I'll, I'll talk about many-to-many -many in a bit, and the user role relationship is a many-to-many. -many. But what was happening was, imagine this room, every one of you clicking a link at once. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to load all of your user objects, we're going to add, a, you're going to store the role, the, the, the new role, and we're going to save it. Now, we're not modifying the, the user objects, right? We sort of are because the user is becoming dirty because its collection gets dirty. But we're definitely not modifying the roles, right? We're granting all of you guys this new role feature 5, right? But the, we're not editing the, the role. We're not modifying the role. So we shouldn't expect a role to cause an optimistic locking exception, but that's exactly what was happening. They were filling up their um, their disks with gigs and gigs of log of exceptions. That was back in the old days before we were uh, really aggressive about trimming groovy stack traces. <laughs> Remember how you know, groovy stack traces are ugly right now? Remember what they were like ten year, uh, eight years ago? So they had um, they were f they were crashing servers because they were running out of disk space. Because what wh what happens, right? Wow! Check out the school new feature. Click. Oh, that didn't work. Weird. Click. That didn't work. Click. Click, click, click. Click, 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 click. Stupid feature. Hey, is this working for you? Click it a couple times. <laughs> and then, what's that smell? You smell smoke? <laughs> so, so I was uh, mostly working from home, and uh, every Tuesday I would come into the office and we would talk about stuff. We would talk about planning for the next week or so. And, and I got there in the afternoon and they were like, oh my God, Bert, we're freaking out. We're so glad you're here. This is, everything's going crazy. So luckily I was... You know, uh, it was it was kind of my sweet spot. It was spring security and Gorm, so it's you know, you know two of the things that I'm most excited about. So luckily, I was able to pretty quickly figure out what was going on and, and come up with a quick workaround. Um, but uh, <laughs> it was pretty pretty horrifying, and they were they were really glad when when we fixed that. So um, f f beyond that, um, Hibernate does not like it when a collection is loaded in two different sessions at the same time because it can't guarantee that it can track the, the things correctly. So um, y you guys have probably seen that. It, it throws an exception. And the most frustrating place that that happens is with Ajax. So for example, you, um, you've got some sort of JavaScript timer or some sort of an event in your UI, and you send a remote request, an, an asynchronous Ajax request out to the server. And so you load the library instance or the user instance, and you get its collection. Um, and then maybe at the same time, you or even someone else loads the same collection um, in a different thread at a different session and it blows up and you get these weird exceptions and there's absolutely nothing wrong with your Ajax call there's nothing wrong with their non-Ajax call but because they happened at the same time kaboom so there's nothing really wrong it's just that Hibernate's gonna, gonna hate this um, so like I say here it's not a performance concern but it is very annoying very frustrating so I'm gonna save the demos till the end so how do we fix this? We just take up the has many. Remember what the name of the talk is? Has many is considered harmful. Don't include harmful things in your code. So what, do, what, do we do, what happens if we delete the has many? And what happens if we delete the, the belongs to? So if this wasn't Hibernate, if this was a regular Java-based, Groovy-based, uh, database front-end application, 
like I said earlier, we're not going to have this collection of things and we add to, you know, remove from. If we want to store a new visit, we just store the visit. We set the person name, we set the visit date, or we leave it alone because it's right now. We set the reference to the library for the visit, and we, set, we save the visit. Full stop. We're done. There's no magic, there's no collections, there's no bullshit. There's just store the visit and do the next thing. Move on to the next problem, right? Does that make sense? Just store the visit. Why are we doing all this stuff when all we want to do is store one visit? Now, there's a lot that you lose here. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to try to say that this is, you know, six one half dozen the other. This is, this is not the same thing. We've lost the belongs to relationship, so we've lost cascading. Now, if I ter try to delete a library, I'll get a foreign key exception. If there's, one, if there's at least one visit attached to that library, it'll blow up because you have to delete the visits before you delete the library. And previously, Gorm was doing that for us because of cascaded deletes. Now, we've got to do it ourselves. Now, I actually think that this is a good thing. It's more work, but it's, it's good work. The reason I say that is that now, instead of just having a method that, uh, a service method, a transactional service method that deletes the library, now I've just got to make that service method just slightly larger. Now I've got to find all the library, all the instant, all the visits that are associated with the li that library and delete those, and then delete the library. It's not a big deal. And actually, if we, if we step back a little bit, the old way before we fixed it was actually really bad. Because if we delete a library, we sort of think, most of the time, all I'm doing is deleting one record, one row. I don't need a transaction for that, right? Because what is the transaction best for? Of course, there's, there's, you know, there's visibility things, and there's a lot of good things about a transaction, but the biggest reason we do transactions is to atomically succeed or atomically fail. So we want all the things we're changing to succeed, or if any one of them uh, fails, roll the whole thing back. But we can easily be tricked into thinking, I'm just deleting a library. You know, and, and we think, you know, cascading, we don't even think about the visits. But in reality, we're doing a lot of deletes, potentially. Those should all be done in a transaction. So by forcing ourselves to handle cascading ourselves, we're being more honest, we're more aware of the fact, and now we can optimize that thing. We can, instead of, and, and to be honest, the naive approach to, to now deleting a visit, the visits in the library is to load all the visits into memory, delete them one by one, and then delete the library. Well, that's almost as bad. Because now it's n plus one. We're loading in n instances of, of visit into memory for no reason. And let's say visit suddenly has 50 columns. Now we're loading in lots of data and just so we can delete the thing. All we need is the idea to delete it. So what you really want to do is a SQL statement. Delete from visit where library ID equals question mark, right? Then delete from library where ID equals whatever. So we want just two SQL statements, not n plus one, but two. So it's very easy using where queries or HQL or even SQL to uh, very performantly, very efficiently do what we wanted to do. So I argue that even though it's more work, it's better work. It makes you more responsible. It makes you a better developer. So it's a good thing. Now, we've also lost the collection. So we don't have easy access to all of the visits for a library. But a lot of the time, we, we don't need that. We certainly need, and we'll talk about many to many in a bit, but we certainly need to know all the roles for a user when we're authenticating. But we don't need to know all the users who have a role most of the time, right? Maybe for reporting or analytics or something. But for, for most of the time, you, you load the user, you load the roles, you check to see if they have the role that they need to do the thing, and then you're good. But you almost never need to know who are all the admins in the system, who are all the users in the system, who are all the super admins, and, you know? So we almost never need all the visits for a library. But what we probably need is the last 10, or this month's, or the ones that are blue, or the ones that happened at 3 o'clock, something like that. So instead of having this lazily loaded collection where we go from nothing to everything, and then we filter in memory, that's really dumb, right? We, we want to do the querying and the filtering at the database. Let the database do what it's good at, and then instead of bringing back all those records and then only using 10 of them, just bring back the 10 that you wanted, right? So now I'm forced to, or I would say I get to, instead of having this easy but bad lazily loaded visits collection, now I, can, I get to write queries 
that say, give me the last 10, give me the last N, give me the last whatever. So now I'm gonna be smarter about querying too. So it's more work, but it's better work. It's, it's, it's more important work. <laughs> Everybody agree? Does this sort of make sense? So how do we use, what, what, what's the syntax for doing this stuff now? So that first line is the same, right? We need to store all the libraries. That, that's still happening. But now to save a visit, we just say new visit, set all the values, set the library, and save it. Of course, you want to check for errors and all that stuff. I mean, this isn't the actual code you'd have in, a, in, your, in, your, uh, in your transactional service, but it, it wouldn't, be much, wouldn't be much bigger than that. So like I said, you, you lose cascading, so you got to do that yourself. Um, but, and you can do some groovy, you can do some tactics here, or you can maybe even use meta class stuff. I mean, you can certainly simplify the, the additional queries and stuff and, and uh, make that more automatic um, so that it isn't quite as, as ugly and boilerplate-y as, as it might be. <coughs> right, and there's some examples of uh, some queries where you can find all the visits for a library, but you can find uh, all the visits for the library with this name, sort it, give, you know, give me the last two, that sort of stuff. You can do as many queries as you like. So is the DDL different? Do I have to run a database migration after making this change to change the data structure, the table structure so that everything works uh, for the new stuff? And if I did, that's going to break all the reports that we wrote in SQL. And you know the DBA is going to be mad at us because the DBA certainly isn't going to use Hibernate. So they're, a, a lot of their stuff is going to break. But it turns out it doesn't change at all. Because remember that, library, that having a foreign key to the other table, is this, that's just how you do this sort of thing. What we've changed is the, is the human logic sort of stuff on the application side. We've inferred from the fact that there are many visits with the same library ID that there is a collection of visits out there that are attached to that library. But that's just, in our, that's just in our minds. That's not how it is in the database. The database doesn't have collections or objects. It has rows and relationships and foreign keys. So nothing changes in the database. And that's important. So we get something very similar with many to many. So the, I'm biased because I do the spring surety stuff, but I think user roles are, is a, is a good example of a, of a many to many. Because you'll have many users that'll share one role. And then a role will be, um, and then a role will have many, many users, right? So it's a bidirectional many to many relationship, uh, standard stuff. So the, w the syntax for doing that in Grails is sort of the same thing as the one-to-many. So you say whatever properties you want, and then it has many roles. And then on the other side, whatever properties on the role you want, and then another collection. And Gorm requires that you pick a, an owning side. So one side is sort of the, the one that drives the, uh, the relationship. So in this case, it's typically going to be the user. So we say we have a belongs to and it doesn't really so much do cascading as it does just sets up the direction of, of stuff. But the, the core thing here is we have two collections instead of just one. And then, so we store a bunch of roles, typically just a handful, maybe a few dozen at most. And then we create users, we set all the properties, we do the same thing, add to roles, right? Create a new user, set all of its properties, Grant it a different role or the same role. Now the user's dirty. Well, it's new, so it's it's dirty because it's got property set, and then it's also going to be dirty with its collection. So by saving the user, it's going to insert the user record, and then there's a new there's a third table, the join table, which is just two foreign keys, um, and a record is going to in be inserted into that for us. And that's one of the nice things about many domain and Grails is that. Um, we don't have re we don't really ever have to think about that third table. We don't there's no domain class for it. You just have users and roles and and Grails and Gorm just magically deal with those three tables for us. So that's again that should be seem pretty normal and pretty similar to the sort of stuff you have in your in your application. Um, so same sort of stuff. It's very object oriented. Uh, it's very similar to one to many. You got add to roles, remove from roles, add to users, remove from users. It's, you've got cascading, all that stuff. The DDL is interesting. So we've got a role table with ID and version and name. 
but no foreign key. User table with an ID and version and uh, its properties, but no foreign key. But, and both foreign keys are in the user roles table. Those point back. So the way that we grant a role to a user is we insert a record into their user role table that has a pointer to the user's ID and a pointer to the role ID. And now we say that there's a the user has many roles, or the role has many users. And then to revoke that grant, all we had to do is delete that record from the user role table. Pretty simple, pretty awesome. So that table becomes the, the important bit here. So same sort of thing, right? So we get two collections. They're set by default. And so if you add a role to the user's roles collection, it's going to be set. Same thing. We've got to load all the previous roles, add in a new one, detect that it's dirty, save that one role, or user role in, at record. Now that is almost never going to be problematic, because most applications are never going to have a huge number of roles, right? You may have a very fine-grained uh, permission sort of type of, of model, but you're probably never going to have more than 50 roles, right? And no user is ever going to have more than maybe four, five or ten in general. So that collection is going to be pretty small. But the, pro <laughs> the problem here is that Grails tries to be friendly, tries to be helpful. And when you make a change in memory, it's going to try to make all the other corresponding changes that will need to be made to make sure that all that the in-memory state is the same as it will be in the future if you were to load all that stuff back again. So if I add, let's say I grant you role user, right? So you had role A and role B, and now you're going to have a third role user. So I say user add to roles, role. What Gorm is going to do is it's going to also add the user to the roles users collection. That's where it gets scary. Because you may only have 10 admins, but you'll have thousands of users, tens of thousands, millions of users. So if I want to add in one new user, uh, one new user instance with role user or role admin or whatever, I got to load all the previous users from the database and that user's roles, all so that I can just add in one record into the user role table. It's twice as, it's, it's, it's twice as bad. Now we've got two potentially large collections. If we're lucky, only one of them is big and the other one's not. But they could be they could both be huge. <laughs> so it's ugly and bad, just the, the same thing. And the classic thing is that this is going to work great on your local machine, right? Because you're, you're not going to have a lot of test data on your local machine. So performance is good. You don't really notice the problem. Most of us don't spend an awful lot of time looking at our SQL uh, output, unless you're a freak like I am, and, and that sort of thing uh, is interesting to you. So you don't notice the problem. And then you're like, all right, I fixed it. QIA says there's no bugs. We fixed all the problems. Ship it. We go into production, and then pff, all hell breaks loose. So how do we fix this? Same thing. We delete the collection from the user. We delete the collection from the role. And now we explicitly map that user role table. We can if we want to. We just don't have to. But if we just insert users, and insert roles, and then to grant a role to a user, we insert a, ro a row into the user role table. The best way to do that is to have a domain class for that table and to create a new instance of it and to save it. Why would you load it, do all that work to throw it away just so you can make that one tiny little change? So it's the same fix as before, slightly different, but it's the same idea, which is don't load in a bunch of crap you don't need just so that you can make that one tiny little change. If you want to make the change, make the change. So we, create, we name the table, uh, we name the domain class whatever we like. And then if we need to, we can change the, use the mapping block to make sure that the table name, um, because Hibernate is now going to try to create that table if it's missing. So you want to ma make sure that the foreign keys are the same names and the table has the same name. So there's usually going to be a little bit of work that needs to be done in order to make sure that there's no DDL changes. Um, so if you've, you've, used, if you've used the Spring Security plugin, then, then you're familiar with the auto-generated code that, that's there. So because you're, there's no direct support in Grails for explicitly mapping the join table, you, you don't have to use these methods. But these are convenience methods that make life a lot easier for you. Um, and, and if we want, if we do want to get all the users' roles or all the roles' users, we can add in those collections. But we can also do really smart stuff. Like, it, instead of querying to see if a user has a role by loading in all the roles and checking each one of them to see if the one we want is there, we can do a very simple query. That's a very lightweight query. 
Let's just select count star from user role where role ID equals whatever. And and that's you that's that's gonna return a number, zero or non zero. And because we def we deter we declare the return type of the method as Boolean, Groovy will convert that from to use, it'll use Groovy truth. So zero is false and anything other than zero is true. So um you either have the role or you don't. So you can again you can you can you get to create very optimized and performant uh even better queries, better um solutions to figuring out your data um than you would have otherwise. And you definitely want to add query caching and that's left as an exercise for the reader. So usage is, is quite different. And again, to do deletes you gotta do cascading and transactions and all that stuff. But again, you, you should have been doing that in the first place. This sort of forces you to do it, or at least it pressures you to do it more, and it gets you thinking more about what's going on and makes you a better developer, more aware of what's going on, and, and hopefully it'll keep you from uh, having future problems because you'll be more aware of the potential for problems because we've turned on this light and we've now, you know, we were blind and now we see. So am I saying that you should never use map collections? Pretty much. Because like I said at the very beginning of the talk, you can think that this will never be big. The design of the application, it just doesn't make sense that this collection would ever be big, big enough to be problematic. But, you know, in a high performance application, even loading 50 and throwing it away, 50 and throwing it away, 50 and throwing it away, that adds up, right? And, you know, maybe you're not going to be Facebook scale, but, you know, you still want stuff to be, you know, you want to minimize the amount of hardware you have to have, and you want to minimize the cost of running everything, you want to, you know, make things you know, without going crazy, you don't want to hyper-optimize, um, but you definitely want to want this stuff to be uh, better. And like I said, I mean, I, I strongly believe that this is m more work, but it is not significantly more work. This is not um, not all that bad. So, what's weird is, and this actually changed a little bit in Gorm, so I'm not entirely sure how it exactly works, but the, um, I think this isn't as much of a problem as it was. But with many to many, it's actually you actually get a an additional n plus one problem, because it used to be the case that collection that uh, many and many collections were uh, extra lazy loaded. So a lazy loaded collection is either empty, uninitialized, or full of full objects. But an extra lazy collection is either empty and uninitialized, or loaded with proxies, which are lazily loaded themselves, and all they have in them is the ID. And so in order to get the data for any one of those instances. Not only did you have to run one query to get all the IDs, but now you've got to run n queries to get the actual data for all those instances. That's terrifying. You're, it's n plus one on top of n plus one. Um, so like I said, I will be uploading the sample code. I have an application with both versions of the code. So I did library visit and user enroll. So I've got both versions. And then the thing I have left to do is, the, um, is just a little write-up. So I've got the sample code. But I want to say, you know, run this and look at the SQL. Run this, look at the SQL change this and then look at the better SQL and hopefully it's better, you know. So um, I will tweet sometime, hopefully soonish. Um, but you've, you've got the uh, URL, so you, you, can, you can check that. Um, and please, if, if, I, if I forget and if, if I blow this off, feel free to bug me on Slack or, or Twitter or something and remind me to do this because I really want you guys to be able to see this stuff for yourself and, and uh, then apply this to your application because um, you're probably harming your application and you don't even know it. So you get to be heroes when you go back to fix your applications on, on Monday. So. so this is out of date at this point, but if you're still stuck on Grails 2, um, buy this book and it'll help you uh, make your, your performance better. Gracias and thanks for coming.